So to uh, commence the special meeting of the uh, Iowa Senate Veterans Affairs Committee uh, addressing the issue uh, at the Iowa Veterans Home. Um, the, uh, the committee secretary will take roll. Any uh, senators are excused until their uh, arrival. Uh, we have um, uh, some additional senators here and uh, uh, the chair of the uh, House Veterans Affairs Committee. So I uh, welcome all of you. Uh, one thing I want to announce before we uh, go into the purpose of this meeting is tomorrow, uh, you may recall about six years ago, um, we, the legislature passed the uh, Vietnam Veterans Recognition Day. It was a very emotional day, wasn't it, Bill? So and uh, a lot of uh, emotions. We didn't even do any business after everybody uh, spoke about this. Tomorrow, we established May 7th as uh, Veterans, uh, uh, Vietnam Veterans Recognition Day. And it'll be at the Iowa State House uh, Capitol Grounds uh, tomorrow at 12 noon. So I want to invite all of you to be part of that. Thank you. Um, also, um, this is a special meeting, but uh, uh, you should have received electronically minutes from the last meeting. I would entertain a motion to uh, accept those, approve those as uh, was electronically. Uh, Senator Ernst, thank you. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed nay. Thank you. The uh, minutes from the last meeting are uh, hereby approved. This Veterans Affairs Committee was created eight years ago with the sole purpose of honoring, assisting, and protecting the men and women who have and who do serve their country. This committee is the voice and advocate of Iowa's veterans. Seventy-seven pieces of legislation later, this remains our mission. About two months ago, I was invited as chairman of the Senate Veterans Affairs Committee to Marshalltown at the request of some community leaders and to listen to several people who voiced serious concerns about the management and the direction of the Iowa Veterans Home and the quality of care for the veteran residents. I want to point out that by voicing concerns about the quality of care, I heard no complaints and I do not mean those hardworking direct care workers. I have found them to be very dedicated and passionate in caring for the veterans. It's been very clear that they take their jobs very seriously. In fact, I uh, came away feeling it's, uh, it's uh, not merely a job with, uh, with them, it's a ministry and mission. Um, what I heard recounted that day was very disturbing. I discussed this matter with the ranking member of this committee and other committee members we decided that by holding this special meeting is the best way to uncover the truth and serve the best interests of our veterans residing at the Iowa Veterans Home. Several people with first-hand knowledge of the situation will, can, will share their observations with us today. I hesitate to call it testimony because this committee, as I understand, lacks the power to depose presenters to testify under oath. Nevertheless, I expect everyone here today to tell the truth. This committee also lacks subpoena power, but I believe we will discover facts and the truth will prevail. Given the number of people making presentations today, we will limit presentations to a total of four minutes. At the end of three and a half minutes, the committee secretary will raise his hand and the, uh, indicate that our presenter has about 30 seconds to complete their remarks. The Commandant's remarks and response will not be subject to the four-minute time limit. He will be provided ample time to share his views and answer our questions. Members of the Veterans Affairs Committee will ask questions and points of clarification from the presenters, including the Commandant, as they conclude their respective remarks. If time permits, and given the, uh, uh, the number of people here, uh, I will uh, allow uh, non-members of, uh, of the Veterans Affairs Committee. We have, uh, we're missing a couple, and uh, we have some non-members here. And also, I would invite the, uh, with the unanimous consent, I will invite our, uh, uh, our at least two IC representatives uh, uh, present to, uh, to be able to ask questions after members of the committee have asked questions. 
Although I do not anticipate uh, any need to seek advice or guidance from non-committee members, we will do so with unanimous consent per committee rules. I'm asking my colleagues and presenters to be sensitive about the time restraints today. We will adjourn by 3.30. This special Veterans Affairs Committee meeting will be conducted in a civil, fair, professional, respectful, and nonpartisan fashion. We will take no formal action today. We'll listen and question. Thank you all for your adherence to these guidelines, and I would thank, uh, like to thank everybody here uh, who, are, uh, who are interested and care about our veterans. Thank you for participating in this today. Um, we have a, a, a list of about 12 presenters, and the presenters will sit at the, uh, the end of the table, and uh, we will, um, again, after their four-minute testimony, we will be able to ask any follow-up questions. Uh, keep in mind, please, that we do have a number of presenters, and so uh, for points of clarification or question, uh, please feel comfortable asking those, but also at the same time be mindful of our time constraints. Our first presenter here today is the Reverend Ken Briggs. Uh, he's a former Air Force chaplain and lieutenant colonel with 23 total years of service. He currently serves as the veterans representative on the Iowa Mental Health Planning Council. Uh, Pastor Briggs, Chaplain Briggs, thank you for uh, your presentation here today. Thank you. I do need to let you know that I'm not new to the Iowa Veterans Home. I've been around the Veterans Home for over 10 years. Two years ago, I became concerned about the Veterans Home. I began visiting with residents and staff alike, and the first thing I was confronted with was I heard people did not really want to say anything because of their fear that things would get back to the Commandant and there would be repercussions. I let them know that I was a retired chaplain, and as I work with people, I handle information with confidentiality. That is who I am. I realize that the most important people serving the residents are the staff, not management. My experience tells me that I don't think management at this time knows that. In my experience, the staff will excel in their service in relation to how management supports them. When I first got to know the Veterans Home, I had great admiration for the staff and the home atmosphere that you always felt as you went about the facility and visited the residents. What I hear from staff today is that many of the long-term experienced staff have left to take other jobs or took early retirement or they were released. They, they were also fed up. They tell me they had gotten tired of being humiliated and treated poorly. Many others still employed are working with disrespect and intimidation from the administration. The threat is you do what I tell you or lose your job. Many cannot risk losing their job no matter how awful it is. The staff tells me it was never this way with any other commandant they worked under. The first of 2012, Teresa Baumhoff, chairman of the Iowa Mental Health Planning Council, and I had a scheduled visit with the commandant. At that time, we had heard that about 40 plus veterans had been dismissed from the facility, and there was com community concern about it. We asked the commandant about this, and his response was, that there were veterans that did not qualify for nursing care. I asked if those veterans had any mental health or chemical abuse problems from the Vietnam War. We were told that those were their problems and the veterans home was not responsible for them. I know Vietnam vets, I'm one, and I know how they have come to these problems. I wonder if we are going to have the same opinion of the PTSD vets. The following are statements from residents that are of concern. Residents shared examples of being treated with disrespect and lack of dignity. Residents said their treatment was poor and that they were very unhappy and afraid. If you talk, you can get hurt, one said. Another said, I just don't care anymore. Residents complained of not being woken up for breakfast and they might get their breakfast for lunch. A resident stated that she was supposed to be bathed daily, but she was lucky to be bathed twice a week because they either didn't come or came at her bedtime. One resident said it was difficult to find someone to push his chair to chapel on Sunday, so he hoped someone will push him there on Thursday. 
People stated the place was not a home anymore. It was a prison. And they said that with tears in their eyes. Many residents and staff have reported the Commandant's style of management is threat and control. They also reported that the Commandant says things to people which are inappropriate and some of these actions are inappropriate. The general feeling experience is we are ashamed to be a vet here anymore. One resident said he had to be lifted from his bed to his chair in a lift and oftentimes his testicles were, were pinched because the training wasn't there with the person who was helping him. Over the last two years, the atmosphere and feeling of this place being a home has made a 180 degree turn for the worse as I've experienced it. The residents feel no one cares. The Iowa this Iowa resource is in trouble and veterans deserve help. We are going to need a positive, healthy veterans home in the future more than even in the past few years with our returning veterans. Thank you. Thank you, Chaplain. Uh, are there any uh, questions for Chaplain Briggs? Seeing none, thank you. For your testimony. Uh, our next speaker is out of order uh, in terms of alphabetical order, but he uh, uh, has a need to get back uh, uh, to him up on our schedule. It's Bill Rakers. He's the former director of recreational therapy. Uh, he retired in 2011 after 29 years at the Iowa Veterans Home. Mr. Rakers, thank you for uh, offering your views today. Thank you. Good afternoon. Therapeutic recreation is to provide programs that will stimulate the minds of each resident while leading to a more enjoyable, active life. This is done by determining the interests and abilities possessed by the veteran to be used to meet their activity needs. Examples of activities provided are attendance at sporting events, meals out at various restaurants, musical entertainment, movies, games such as cards, bingo, etc. Visits to places of interest such as the Amanda's Pella Tulip Festival and fishing to name just a few. The goal is to make life worth living despite physical and emotional limitations experienced by the veterans. This program was successful by working as a group of professionals who together planned and carried out an ever-changing daily activity program. It was led by a director whose main goal was to obtain more and different activity opportunities while scheduling available competent staff to carry out these activities. Vehicles were scheduled, equipment was serviced, facilities were reserved as regular recreation responsibilities. Timely meetings were held in the department to stay on top of ever-changing needs of residents with support from administration to put the residents and their happiness first. Mr. Worley and Mrs. Callaway, after assuming leadership of IVH, decided to dismantle the department. The director position was abolished. Each therapist was put under the supervision of a nurse who possessed no training or knowledge of therapeutic recreation. Each therapist was responsible for the unit. The team approach was removed. Time became an issue as each therapist basically was put on their own with no leadership help. Residents who had benefit from trips with other units saw that ability severely cut back. The number of activities was reduced. Resident attitudes plummeted because professional staff were not available to provide quality activities in a timely manner due to decisions made by nursing unit leaders appointed by Mr. Worley and Mrs. Callaway. Many residents told me personally, it's just not the same anymore. We don't get to do as much as we did. We are bored more often now. Mrs. Mr. Worley and Mrs. Callaway expected the nurses to provide this leadership. It did not happen. Now recreation therapists are told no overtime. If an activity is going on and time is up, the activity must be halted. This becomes a less than quality experience for our residents. Resident frustration is to be expected and happens. Under Mr. Worley and Mrs. Callaway, resident needs were no longer a priority. Cost reduction and non-existent leadership from nursing was to carry the day. Good resident care designed to meet the recreation needs of these residents was the ultimate loser. During the last year of my employment, 2011, a loving, caring atmosphere that had been IVH for 29 years of my employment changed into, this is an institution. Staff are being watched at all times to make sure they are being doing as told. Residents will follow rules or we'll get rid of them, both staff and residents. The desire to honor our veterans with a loving group of staff feeling empowered to provide care to make veterans' lives better was being abandoned. Concern for their well-being was becoming less a priority. No time to work with, to give them time to feel comfortable and trust staff. No time to build relationships. Move residents in and as soon as possible, move them out. Staff who suffered an unfortunate health situation like cancer were put on notice that time away from work would be monitored to make sure they either got back ASAP or they might face dismissal, even if due to no fault of their own. IVH needs people who can work. Sorry about your problem, but you're on your own now. Your time is up. 
It was obvious IVH was no longer a caring facility. Cost reduction was valued more than care. 29 years of care and concern I saw disappear in a year. What had been a source of joy and pride was now <coughs> shameful and threatening, both to residents and staff. What had been a loving, caring home atmosphere at IVH was now an institution. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rakers. Uh, do we have any? Uh, okay, Senator Danielson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Rakers, thank you for your presentation here today. Was there an internal process available to you or others to bring these issues in a formal way to the management? and have them at least listened to, if not followed up on? No. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. S Senator Saunders. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Bill, when you say uh, you said you went to a unit, unit leadership from what it was before, uh, and team leadership before. Okay, so can you tell, can you just describe that a little bit more and, and why in your opinion, uh, that changed things. Yeah, you mentioned something about nurses now being in charge of the counselors or something like that. Charge of recreation therapy. Okay. They, they dictated to the recreation therapist how the programs were going to be run. And if you know if those nurses who are now head of the units have any experience or training or anything in your, your area? None that I was aware of. Senator Hurst. Um, you you mentioned that there was a, an employee that had cancer that was told to hurry up and get back to work. There are federal laws that regulate that. I'm aware of that. Um, were those federal laws not not followed, or what is your personal awareness of, of the human resources situation there? Well, I'm not in the personnel department, but my understanding was that if you had an illness and you were struggling to overcome that illness, that you would have the time given to you with FEMLA and other instances mm -hmm. to overcome that illness and get back to work. My experience, however, was, and I had a person in my staff who had cancer, and it, it, they weren't a good performer, but that had nothing to do with retaining them. And it, it, I felt in the decisions made to pressure this person into either getting back or getting out, that the real thought was they weren't a good performer, we just didn't get rid of them anyhow. And that's my truthful thought to that. Okay, I would, I would just remind everybody that there are regulations in place for that as well as labor law. There are regulations that nursing homes have to adhere to. And if there are employees that are going to be absent, that has to be looked at. But laws have to be followed, right. absolutely, right. and care needs to be given to those employees. But then at some point, they do need to backfill those, those positions to make sure that residents are being cared for. I understand. Also. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Senator Hart, did you have a question? I want to thank you for coming in here today, sure. too. I, I know this isn't easy. Um, I, I guess I was really bothered by the statement that you made that said that staff and residents, and I don't know exactly how you, how you said that, but if they weren't cooperative, that we'll just get rid of them? That was, that was a statement that you made? Can you elaborate a little bit on okay. that? Okay. I, I want to state that with a time limit, I didn't want to go into a big digression on it, okay? But in, in reality, what if we had residents or staff, staff who weren't performing, and residents who were just a continual problem, the idea was behind that was if we're not going to go the extra mile to try to help these people out and make them overcome these dif difficulties. We'll eventually just have them move on. Now, I don't know for sure how they did that, but it seemed like these people left. Uh, and I, I, as an example, Heinz Hall, we had folks that, that went. And I don't know exactly what their, their diagnosis was in that. But it, to us as employees, the frustrating part was we, we were working in a loving, caring institution. Uh, inst now I'm saying institution too, but a home. And all of a sudden these people are gone and when we asked what, what happened, well, we felt their stay was long enough they could move on. And, and to us who've been there, I've been there 29 years, I've seen the type of residents we had and their needs. And to me, it was a, and there are many other employees that agree with me that it was an idea that we don't feel that we we're gonna mess with these guys anymore. Let's move them out and get some new, new veterans in here. Because we had waiting lists at one time and we needed to get people in and out. But that's my opinion and that's what I'm expressing to you, okay? Thank you, Senator McCoy. 
Thank you, uh, Bill, for being here today, and thanks for sharing. Uh, I wondered if you could talk about your own situation a little bit. Uh, you were there for 29 years. That's quite a career. Uh, when did you determine it was time for you to retire or leave? Well, I determined it when they told me that they would remove me from the leadership position and moving me to running switchboard and security. They were moving me to a new office that had a backed up far away from any of the residents that I had spent my 29 years working with. My staff were told they could not come and talk to me about recreation and I could not talk to them about recreation. It was extremely and, and, and you were trained to uh, be a vocational rehabilitation yeah. therapist. I, I was a vocational rehabilitation counselor before I came to the Veterans Home, but 30, the 29, 30 years of the Veterans Home were strictly as a recreation therapy coordinator. And you were moved to security and switchboard, and switchboard mm -hmm. which is answering the phone? Right. And what was your salary? Uh, my salary was 64000 That's a pretty high-paid switchboard operator, wouldn't you say? I would say so, yes. Yeah. Well, um, at, at uh, that time you decided it's time for me to go. Where are you now? Um, right now I'm a substitute high school teacher at East Marshall in the Grand, and I love it. Love the kids, and they seem to like me so far. And I also work at the YMCA as a floor monitor and bus driver. Has your position been filled? No. And uh, what has happened to your responsibilities that you, that you maintained in that position? Some just kind of filtered out into the atmosphere and others, they had uh, various nurses who were called to handle things and they'd say, well, I don't deal with that. And then it was passed on to another one. I'm getting this from staff who have called me and talked to me about it. Okay, and I wasn't there. The and at what point did you uh, separate from the Veterans Home? October 21st, 2011. Thank you. You bet. Uh, can I also add that they also indicated to me they were going to cut my salary, still. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. To what? They didn't ever, never told me because it was brought up when we were discussing whether I was going to stay or not. And they said, well, since you're leaving, we won't worry about it. And that was told to me by the personnel director. Senator Rosenbaum. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thanks for coming, Mr. Richards. I you uh, mentioned that what was a loving, caring environment is now an institution. My question is, prior to the uh, change in Commandant, well, how would you describe the atmosphere there? You called it loving and caring, but were there problems that you felt would, should have been addressed at that time? Uh, any large facility is going to have some difficulties occasionally, but it was the, the way the difficulties were approached by our leadership team. Uh, it was, you'll do it this way. There was no discussion. If you brought anything up, they did not listen to what your concerns were. 29 years that I've been there didn't make any difference. It was just, this is the way it's going to be, learn to accept it. And so then all of a sudden it became, we're not really caring a whole lot about people here. We're going to run it this way because this is the way I'm going to do it. I'm the commandant and this is my assistant and we're going to do it this way. And that was what was so frustrating about it because you spend 29 years of your life, you've got some ideas of how things could be run or should be run, and at least give me an opportunity to, to express those ideas. And I never got that opportunity. Okay. Um, thank you, Mr. Rakers. I really appreciate your presentation today. Um, our next person to share her views are, uh, is Robbie Corum. Uh, she's a former social worker at the Iowa Bedford's Home. She retired in June of 2012 after more than 28 years there. Uh, thank you, Ms. Ms. Corum, and uh, we appreciate your testimony here today. Thank you. My name is Robbie Corum. I worked as a social worker for 28 and a half years at the Iowa Veterans Home. I feel very fortunate to have worked the majority of my career serving our nation's veterans. I retired on June 8th of last year, several years earlier than I had planned. The fact that I'm retired gives me the freedom to speak here today. I feel that I'm speaking for many of my former co-workers who aren't here today because they fear retribution if they should publicly speak their concerns. I am not a dis disgruntled former employee. My only motivation in speaking today is the sincere and deep caring and commitment to IVH's residents and staff. 
the hostile, threatening, unkind, and repressive leadership of Commandant Worley and Deputy Director Callaway is having a terribly negative effect on the overall functioning of IBH and its residents and employees. Based on the current leadership, I have grave concerns for the future quality of living and quality of care for the residents of IBH. Commandant Worley has broken down the infrastructure of the Veterans Home by firing or demoting department heads and demolishing entire departments. By removing experienced and knowledgeable people, he has taken away the necessary check and balance for a healthy working operation. During my tenure, I always felt fortunate to be part of an agency that prided itself on resident care. But under Commandant Worley and his deputy director, I sadly watched them destroy this along with resident advocacy and the interdisciplinary team process. The Commandant and deputy director adopted a philosophy of unit-based teams under the guise that decision-making affecting our residents will be made at the unit level versus administration. Well, this philosophy sounds like a great idea. This is not how it was carried out. I was frequently part of a team decision-making process to only have those decisions squashed or reversed by administration. This compromises our ability to advocate for residents. It is important to note that nurse supervisor positions have recently been changed to at will. This makes them vulnerable to pressure from the top and ultimately impacts the functioning of the resident care and further compromises resident care and advocacy. There's an, an unhealthy imbalance of power. Nursing personnel now oversee most all operations of the facility. There is a concern that nurse supervisors do not have the time, training, or expertise to adequately have an understanding of our job duties and professional standards and practice. Individual voices have been silenced. They have taken away our leaders, refused our requests to hold staff meetings, and compromised our professional standards. Upon dialogue, open dialogue is stifled because differences of opinion are often met with anger, hostility, and further control. Communication from the commandant and the deputy director was almost non-existent. Everything was done that appeared to be in a secretive manner, and I was told numerous times that everything is on an as-needed basis only. This lack of transparency has caused a fear and lack of trust of our management. I believe that David Worley and Shauna Calloway have caused a degrading of IVH and should be removed. We have seen a large exodus of long-term employees quit, take retirement before they had planned, or demotions in order to maintain their jobs. The word fear, bullying, and intimidation repeatedly arise as the cause. In order to get an understanding of what is happening at IVH, I implore you to send an impartial investigator or investigators to talk to those that have left and to current staff at IVH and to residents and to do it in such a way that they can speak without administration present and without fear of reprisal. I think you would be shocked at what you find. Also, the Department of Administrative Services has conducted two investigations on Commandant Worley. I, as well as many other IVH employees, submitted reports that included serious allegations. Why was there no response? Caring staff put themselves out there and deserve to have an answer. We talk about transparency in government, but it doesn't seem to have occurred in this situation. I respectfully request this committee check to see if transcripts are available to review and draw their own conclusions. Thank you for this opportunity to share my concerns. I ask that you take the points I've shared and consider if this is the leadership we wish to have for our vulnerable veterans and their families who come to the Iowa Veterans Home seeking our services and care. Thank you, Ms. Forum. Um, I had a, I'd like to ask a question. You used two words, and I wonder if you would give me a you know, specific uh, example. Uh, you used the words hostile at one time and intimidating. Can you give me an actual, uh, for example, uh, situation that uh, would, uh, would describe the, those, uh, those terms, please? I could probably give you uh, several examples I'm going to tell you one that comes to mind because it's the, the first thing that happened um, in my interaction with David Worley. It was um, about one or two months into his employment at the Veterans Home, and he paged me down to his office, and he began to ask me about my supervisor, who was the resident uh, family services director at the time. And I feel like he was trying to lead me into saying negative things about him, and I just wouldn't engage in that conversation. And, Subsequently, then he was, uh, my, my boss was uh, let go, he was fired. But then um, within that same conversation, he just started talking, 15 minutes of a kind of rambling stories of his background, uh, father alcoholic, many brothers and sisters that have problems he doesn't have con contact with. He has 
Um, he was in foster care. He was he ran the streets. I was tough. And he told some story about being in an apartment. I can't remember if it was a gun or a knife. And he was fighting with someone and chased him off a second story building. And I mean, I wasn't engaged in the conversation. I was just listening. And I felt at the time that was so bizarre and so weird and uncomfortable. I didn't know what that was about. And I look back and I, I know now, I, I realized it was like, I, this was a form of saying, I'm tough, I'm gonna, I'm the boss, don't mess with me. That's what it felt like. Thank you. Um, thank you, any, uh, 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 Senator Reagan. Um, were, were you a part of the process when the 40 veterans were I can't, I'm just going to say, I don't know if I can reach that to get the microphone. <laughs> Sorry about that. Were you a part of the discussion when the 40 veterans were asked to leave? Um, sorry, I was not a part of that. I worked on a dementia unit where the folks were in the secured units at that time. And would you say that there has been any change in, in admittance or that you're aware of or not? And I can't speak to that. It's been almost a year since I've been out of the facility. Thank you. Senator Hart. Thank you again for being here today. I appreciate that. And um, my question has to do with, again, um, something that you said that I would, I would like an example of. You talked about um, the lack of transparency and, and secretive mm -hmm. um, hearings on. We do expand on that. Um, I worked there, well, as I said, 28 and a half years. And during that whole time, we always felt like, as staff, we were part of that facility. And by that I mean when there was decisions made, there was changes made to the TO, we were aware of them. We, uh, memos came out, people told us it would trickle down to us through supervisors. We knew. And Excuse me, TO? The, the table of organization, I'm sorry. And what was happening was it felt like chaos because we, my boss was fired, the director of nursing was demoted, there was just constant change. The, there was a whole shifting of who was supervising what areas. Honest to goodness, we, there were so many times we would laugh, didn't know what to laugh or cry. It was just, well, who's, who are we supposed to call for this? And so we just never knew what was happening throughout the facility. Then when I would approach my unit manager, who was then my new boss, she said it was just as a as needed basis only. And need to know. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Ms. Crum, uh, for your um, for your comments. Thank you. Um, our next uh, presenter is going to be uh, presented uh, vicariously uh, through uh, through Mike Schlesinger. Um, Mike Krosky is the president of the Iowa Veterans Home Resident Council. I always call him Mayor Mike. And uh, his letter will be read by uh, Mike Schlesinger, uh, the publisher of the Marshalltown Times Republican. And Mike, I see that you are also um, going to be presenting another letter uh, from Sherry Tickey. Yeah. And uh, if uh, I think in the interest of time and efficiency, uh, as long as you're at the table, We'll give you some extra time so that you can uh, uh, read both uh, both letters. Uh, I, I think that will serve as well. Thank you for being here today, Mike. Thank you, Senator Bill, uh, Senators, and other guests. My name is Mike Schlesinger. I'm the publisher of the Marshalltown Times Republican and 11 other newspapers and publications in Iowa. You may wonder why I'm speaking since I have no obvious direct ties to the Iowa Veterans Home. I have been in my current position for the past 28 years. During that time, I have had the opportunity to visit the Iowa Veterans Home many times, either to visit residents whom I know or to work in community leadership projects with various Iowa Veterans Home staff. Because of that relationship, I was approached in early March by people concerned about what was happening at Iowa Veterans Home. Having been a manager for 35 years, at first I was skeptical about employee complaints since I know what it's like to change schedules, to reduce budgets, managers do get pushback. I get it. But when I was told the hostile working conditions were now affecting veterans, 
I knew I had to find out more. So on March 15th, I agreed to host a meeting to hear the complaints firsthand. Seven former and current IVH employees shared their stories. I also asked Senator Beal to attend the meeting. The stories were horrifying. The people were absolutely credible. I have been a manager for long enough to detect when someone is embellishing or lying. This was not the case. And to further add to their credibility, many of those present read their stories straight from their DAS reports that had already been filed with the state. They gave examples of the Commandant saying sexually harassing comments to women, comments that, frankly, anyone in private business would be fired for. I heard from one person who was physically threatened when the Commandant screamed at them saying, don't F with me, and I won't go into that. I have guns, I have a brother in prison for murder, so don't F with me. Both these individuals were advised by attorneys not to appear here today for fear of the Commandant. These excerpts from their stories and other stories you have heard or will hear today are compelling, believable, and would result in termination in any business. I would hope that the governor will act in order to protect employees, residents, and the state of Iowa from potential lawsuits. I would like to at this time read excerpts from two letters from one from an Iowa Veterans Home resident and the other is from a former IDH uh, worker. I will provide the complete letters to uh, Senator Beal at the end of this testimony. The first letter is from Mike Krotsky, who was unable to attend this meeting today due to physical restrictions. He is a 16-year resident of the Iowa Veterans Home and is currently resident council president. He has been president for the last 13 years. Quote, during this time, I've had the privilege to work with six commandants, Jack Dack and John Mathis, knew what was required to make IVH a quality place to live and work. Since David Worley has been commandant, the morale of the residents and staff have never been lower. Our staff used to be proud to be employed at IVH, but now many of our best staff have been forced or intimidated to leave. We have experienced so much turnover here that our residents never know from one day to the next who will be providing our care. As resident council president, many of our veterans and spouses came to me with concerns. Here are just a few comments from the last few months from those veterans who came to Mike. If I would have known this is how I would have been treated at the end of my life, I would have never served in the military. Another veteran said, I want my home back. The Commandant has taken home out of Iowa Veterans Home. Krotsky said, my biggest concern is that many of our residents will not speak up to this Commandant for fear of retaliation and being discharged. I know of at least 40 veterans who were discharged who did not want to leave. Quote, we used to have input as residents regarding decisions for our home our care and our activities and things that we enjoy. Since Mr. Worley has been in charge, that is not the case. There have been multiple grievances filed against him for inappropriate behavior. Any other staff behaving like this would have been terminated. Many of the privilege we, privileges we used to enjoy have been taken away. There must be a better solution than to take away the freedoms we all fought for. It's the end of Mr. Krotsky's letter. Another letter is from Sherry Tickey. Ms. Tickey worked at Iowa Veterans Home for 38 years. She related a story on how the Iowa Veterans Home used to have a program called the Clothes Closet. The people donated clothing to the veterans to shop from. She gave an example of a veteran who had no dress clothes to attend a family funeral but was able to get a nice suit through the clothes closet. When the veteran got to the funeral, his daughters began to cry because their dad looked so nice. The veteran could not speak because of a stroke that he had suffered earlier, but his eyes also filled with tears. The Commandant has closed that operation. 
Ms. Tickey stated how her mother, who is a resident at IVH, said that staff shortages affect residents' care at feeding time and in response time to staff calls when the call light goes on. She also said that she was denied by Mr. Worley from even putting up a poster for a fundraiser for a National Guard unit so that they could have Skype in order to communicate with loved ones. Senator DeVille, this completes my testimony. Thank you, Mike. Um, I failed to mention that uh, Ms. Tickey retired after 38 years as a ward clerk, I believe was her position. Um, um, Senator Al or Representative Alonz. Thank you, Senator DeVille. Uh, for the record, would you for the record, could you note that there are five House members present, um, and you need I, their names afterward? Uh, I have, I have four. Um, so yeah, I need. Um, I will duly note that. Okay, but thank you. I um, might just note this: that uh, Representative Alonz is the uh, chairman of the uh, House Veterans Affairs. And I have a question. Please. Thank you for uh, coming and bringing your testimony. Uh, you mentioned that grievances were filed. Could you elaborate a little bit on the outcome of that and the process and who reviews and, and uh, actual results of the grievances? I, I actually read that from Mike Krotsky's letter. So I have oh. no knowledge of the grievances, but that's what Mr. Krotsky said in his letter. I'm sorry I don't have I, the answer to that. To follow up on that, then I think we need to have more information related to that because it appears there's some type of a grievance process to be filed but we don't have the results of that with this testimony um thank you i uh, i accept that point and uh, uh i will endeavor to uh, to try to get that uh, that information i i'm not privy to it at this point but uh, uh, we'll do our best okay thank you mike i appreciate you being here uh, our next presenter is Colonel jo uh, Todd Jacobus. He is the chair of the Iowa Commission of Veterans Affairs and is a member of the Iowa Army National Guard since 1988. Thanks for being with us, Colonel Jacobus. Thank you, Senator Beal, uh, Representative Alonce, members of the Senate and House Veterans uh, Committee. Thank you for establishing this platform from which we can exchange information and perspectives in a professional manner relative to the Iowa Veterans Home. My name is Todd Jacobus and I have served on the Iowa Commission of Veterans Affairs since January of 2008. There are nine commissioners, each representing a veteran service organization, and I have served as chairperson since July of 2011. The duties of the Iowa Commission of Veterans Affairs are outlined in the Code of Iowa, Chapter 35A.3. Relative to the Iowa Veterans Home, the Commission shall, shall supervise the Commandant's administration of Commission policy, the operations, and conduct of the Iowa Veterans Home. So the issues and concerns that you have relative to the home are very much in the area of responsibility that we have as a Commission. And we address any issue brought to our attention very quickly. We are committed to working with the leadership team to provide as positive an environment for the 600 residents and the 840 employees that is very possible. Dan Gannon, who represents the uh, Vietnam Veterans of America on the commission, <coughs> serves as the liaison between our commission and the Iowa Veterans Home. Dan is currently visiting family in Florida and not able to be present today. Well, Dan Gannon and I are co in contact with David Worley no less than weekly, and we are very pleased with his open, open, openness and transparency in the conduct of business. A first and foremost concern to each of the commissioners of Veterans Affairs is the well-being of Iowa veterans and their spouses residing at the Iowa Veterans Home. I first met David Worley in the fall of 2010, following his appointment as Commandant. After an initial meeting with him, I quickly grasped that he was very knowledgeable about nursing home administration and about program management with the Department of Veterans Affairs, and that he is a very confident administrator who is quite proud of his service to our nation as a non-commissioned officer in the United States Army. It was also very apparent to me that David Worley has a passion for those who serve and those who have served. Anyone who has walked down the hallways of the home with David Worley has marveled at his being on a first name basis with veterans. His knowledge of their families, their hobbies, their interests. Veterans there are visibly pleased to see David when they cross paths in the hallway. 
That has been my experience, and that has been Dan Gannon's experience as well, and that has also been the experience of other commissioners and veteran service organizations representatives with whom I've spoken. Since serving as the chair of the commission, I have been very pleased with David Worley's proactive communication with me regarding issues and situations at the Iowa Veterans Home. Very regretfully, there were three incidents in May, July, and September of 2012 where residents fell and injured themselves. Each resulted in a visit to the Iowa Veterans Home by the Department of Inspection and Appeals. Both Dan Gannon and I were made aware of the details of each incident by the Commandant very quickly, and both of us are satisfied that safeguards were in place to reduce the likelihood of these accidents taking place a second time. One comment that stands out in my mind relative to David Worley's commitment to the Iowa Veterans Home and Iowa Veterans is that he does not want the Iowa Veterans Home to be a last resort opportunity for a veteran with no other option. David has shared with me that he wants the Iowa Veterans Home to be the cho home of choice for Iowa veterans. There is no question in my mind that the Iowa Veterans Home is getting the absolute best, the veterans there are getting the absolute best in terms of <coughs> care and treatment. As Commandant Worley would share with you, this quality of care is in large part due to the outstanding performance and dedication of a professional staff, from the department heads to the maintenance crew all working together as a team. I don't know what the results of this meeting will be, and I don't anticipate walking away from this meeting with a losing side and a winning side. I hope to walk away from this meeting with a shared perspective of employees, residents, legislative leaders, and Iowans relative to how we move forward to continuing improvement at the Iowa Veterans Home. This concludes my presentation. Thank you, uh, Colonel Jacobus. Do we have any, uh, Senator Ernst? Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you for being here, Colonel Jacobus. Uh, so far, I've, I've heard a number of things that have been concerning, um, as well as some things that, that could possibly be sorted through as far as regulations at the home. Uh, but the things that are concerning me, uh, testimony from previous workers, I don't have names for those workers, but are these incidents that were brought to the commission, was the commission made aware of, of these situations? There are a lot of things that have changed um, over the last two and a half years at the Iowa Veterans Home in terms of administration. Um, some of these have been discussed in detail with Dan Gannon and I and the rest of the commission. Um, we don't get into the daily workings of personnel related actions. Um, um, you know, we, we provide, you know, we have a presence at the, at the uh, Veterans Home um, and we follow up on issues when they're brought to our attention. Um, there's, there's always a rest of the story. And when issues of sensitive nature have brought, been brought to our attention, we ask David Worley about it. David Worley has always had a response that makes sense. Um, okay. Thank you, Colonel Jacobus. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Senator Hart. Thank you for being here and thank you for your presentation. Um, you can see that there's some, I'm, I'm having a hard, I'm having difficulty um, coinciding your testimony with the testimony previous to yours. I'm wondering about turnover. Um, there's mentioned that there was, there's been a great deal of turnover. Can you talk to me about that turnover and whether you have concerns about that turnover and why that turnover does exist? I'd say I, I, I have concern about turnover in general. Um, we have, um, you know, I guess, I guess, We've not been made aware of the reasons why people have been leaving their employment with the Iowa Veterans Home. I can share with you that um, I personally visited a leadership meeting uh, with 50 of the supervisory staff at the Iowa Veterans Home in January where we asked these questions. We understand there are challenges and issues concerning with the administration of the Iowa Veterans Home. Please let us know what those are. We want to dig into those in more detail. We want to get feedback. Um, and I've not been made aware of, you know, nobody has reached out to me to do so. Dan Gannon, uh, the, the uh, liaison from the Iowa Veterans uh, Commission to the Veterans Home, has done the same thing, walked out, handed out business cards, asked individuals to, uh, you, know, you know, try to make a presence of the Iowa Commission within the Iowa Veterans Home. Um, the issues that we've been identified as problem areas have been followed up on and they don't pertain to the leadership of David Worley and the, and the leadership of the Iowa Veterans Home. They involve 
you know, issues that individual veterans have um, relative to a variety of issues. And they're not, they're not leadership type issues, they're frustrations with, you know, the management of policy, the implementation of policy at the Iowa Veterans Home. Senator McCoy. Thank you, Colonel. I appreciate you being here today and uh, taking part in this hearing. Uh, if I could, I'd like to ask you a little bit more about uh, the meeting that you held uh, with 50 supervisory staff. When was that meeting held? I'm going to say it was in January of this year. And, and what was the purpose of that meeting? Well, every month uh, the Commandant gets his leadership team together and um, ha has a uh, has an established meeting with the, with all his supervisors. And um, I asked him if I could come, um, make a presentation to them, and ask them questions, and be a part of that meeting, which I did. Why did you do that? Because um, in very general terms, people had said they were frustrated with the leadership of the Commandant. Who were the people? Uh, a variety of veteran service organizations, and I'm talking in very general terms. Um, you know, statements like, um, we're frustrated with the Commandant. We are, um, we, we, uh, we'd like to see the Commission implement some leadership at the Veterans Home and make some changes there. And our question back is, based on what? Based on what specific issues would you like us to take action? Well, things are out of control at the Veterans Home. Uh, the, uh, common, uh, one of the comments was made is that there's, a, there's, there's a veterans at the home that are being abused. And my comment to the staff at that time was, if there is a resident of our Veterans Home that is being abused, it is your responsibility as a supervisor and an employee to pursue this, to present this, not to necessarily to the, to the commission, but there's very, very specific processes when you feel that somebody's being abused, uh, abused by staff that you're obligated to respond to. Um, How many uh, folks approached you, Colonel? After that meeting? No, prior to the meeting. Uh, we were approached by one of the veteran service organizations that brought us to their headquarters building. What was that organization? This is American Legion. Okay. And and anyone else from the from the staff? Um, very recently, uh, Dick Schrott and I had a conversation that lasted uh, qu quite a while. Okay. So, and, and that, that sums up how many people had approached you prior to this January meeting that occurred? No, I think, you know, there were, there were others. There were, there were others within the community that made similar type uh, allegations. Have you ever heard the expression where there's smoke, there may be fire? Absolutely. Okay. I've absolutely heard that. You bet. Uh, Colonel, uh, if, if I could just take you to uh, the, the comments that you made about there had been enormous amount of changes in two and a half years. That was one of your comments. Yes. What did you mean by those changes? Well, there's, uh, we have, you know, if you've been, the, the veterans home has evolved. Um, one of the changes is that no longer are veterans uh, living in, uh, you know, shared rooms. Uh, they are now living in single dwelling rooms. That's right. And as we have done that, um, our, the staff there has been spread out um, just because there's more square footage to, uh, to, to manage. And um, as a result, there's had, you know, the, uh, the Commandant has uh, made some changes that, uh, in order to make sure that we provide the very best and, and, and meet the requirements that are expected by the uh, Department of Veterans Affairs and the, and the uh, management of the Iowa Veterans Home. Okay. So, so in this two and a half years worth of changes, and you, you, aren't, you aren't versed in the day-to-day the day-to-day -day operations of, of the department, but in, this, in these changes that have occurred, um, staff turnover and, and, and elimination of a vocational, tech, uh, vocational uh, rehabilitation program, none of those rose to the occasion of, you know, gee, why are we eliminating vocational rehabilitation and, you know, why are we making the moves that we're making with, I assume you know Bill Rakers, why are we making those decisions? I would, uh, one of the issues that was brought to my attention is to, is the restructuring of the opportunities that veterans uh, are able to go out to the communities. Uh, going to an Iowa Cubs game, going to Prairie Motos, going to some of the, uh, um, you know, and. Um, of course, we want to see there be a lively, vibrant, social life for the veterans at the Iowa Veterans Home. Um, 
that was a discussion point that Dan Gannon and I and some of the other commissioners had with the Commandant. And he has assured us that there are great uh, opportunities for that very thing to happen. And that there is not a reduction in the level of opportunities out there for veterans, um, only that it's managed in a different way than it was before. Finally, the last question I have is related to this meeting that occurred in January of 2013. Did employees speak to you at that meeting about their concerns? And was, the, and was the Commandant present? Yes, the Commandant was present. Um, and it was an opportunity for, at, at this specific meeting, um, you know, the, the directors came, uh, the, the, uh, the supervisory staff came with issues, uh, what they determined to be strengths within their departments and where there uh, needed to be some improvements within their departments. And I thought it was a very healthy exchange of information. I and, thought it was and excellent. how long did that meeting last? I'm going to say around two hours. Thank you. Okay. Um, thank you, uh, Colonel Jacobus. Oh, I had a question. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't see uh, Senate, uh, Representative Alonzo. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you for your uh, testimony for coming here today. Uh, my question does go back to the previous uh, speaker that brought up this thing about grievances. And does the commission receive those grievances or where does that get handled in this whole process? The commission is not involved in grievances. Um, there is a, uh, a process um, between the, uh, you know, the department and the Department of, it, of, of Management where those are, are vetted. So we don't get into the individual grievance level type situation. So there's a, there's a separate process involving um, you know, the, the uh, internal state government, which the, which the uh, commission has not rolled into. And there were some fairly significant charges brought about sexual harassment and also threats of um, what may happen if something was pursued. Did you see any documentation of that? I have not. I have not been made aware of sexual harassment of, uh, of, of any kind of, um, I, and, and like I say, these are things that have been brought as, I've heard that this is an issue. We've heard that, uh, that some of our residents and our staff members are being threatened. And my comment was, I would love to talk to the individual that's been threatened firsthand. I would like them to tell me who they are um, and you know, bring us specific information. Um, and what I'm told is, well, they don't want to come talk because they're, they're, they, don't want to, uh, they don't want to identify themselves because of fear of reprisal. So my comment is, what, what action are we supposed to take based on somebody, you know, an, somebody through a secondhand party relaying, you know, uh, allegations? Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Senator Sauters, I had your name down. I apologize for not calling on you. I'm okay. Thank you, Senator Bill. Colonel, uh, just a couple of follow-up questions. So um, the fear of reprisal is what you heard, and I think when we go to grievances, we're really talking about that's more of the union employees, but a lot of the complaints that I've gotten are non-union employees or management and other folks. Do you know that uh, both Conrad kind of Worley and I think every department had to sign a uh, at-will statement? Do you realize that? So when you talk to these, these managers back in January, did you know they were all forced to sign an at-will? I think that was after that meeting took place. I, I'm not that sure. Was the same day. Did it? I don't know. I'm, at, I'm, at, I, I'm not aware of that. Well, in part, and I'm going to read folks part. I mean, this may be why you didn't get anybody to talk to you. In part, it says, you must acknowledge receipt of notice that indicate whether you, you're, you consent to the change of your position. If you do not consent to the change of coverage, a reduction of force may be initiated in accordance with the rules of the Department of Administrative Services. So if I read that to you and said, hey, you've got to sign this, how much are you going to say? I'm, I'm a little concerned about that. Now that's been changed, and I have some questions more on, on I don't believe anybody at the Veterans Home has been able to re-sign the new form, but that's the form I believe that, that you, when you were talking to them, I just want to make you aware. That might be why none of them really said anything. Okay. I mean, I wouldn't say anything. If I, if I thought if I said something, I'm going to lose my job. I think that's a concern. I think that's part of why we're here today. So, thank you. Okay, thank you, Colonel. Um, our next uh, presenter, did you have a question? Please? I'm sorry, can we ask you to come back? I had you down and then I was told no, you were just going to have a lot. Since then, I've got a question. Okay. <laughs> um, 
The, uh, the ranking member, uh, Senator Rosenberg, has a question. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Colonel uh, Jacobus. Uh, like Senator Hart, I'm new here. We don't have any history here. Like Senator Hart, I'm trying to reconcile two different pictures of the Iowa Veterans Home. And obviously your testimony differs from that of some others. My question for you would be if you could give me two or three adjectives to describe uh, the Veterans Home prior to the last two and a half years, and two or three adjectives to describe it today, uh, would you do that please? Uh, I'm just trying to get a feel for 